This video is about the flow of energy in ecosystems, how energy might go from the sun to a producer, to a consumer, to other consumers. Uh, so that is the basis of this video. That is what we're looking at. One thing that I believe is important as we move forward and as we begin here is that energy never just disappears magically. Uh, the total amount of energy in the system remains constant. Uh, it takes on different forms as it goes through food webs and food chains and uh, some of it is lost along the way but it never disappears. It just goes somewhere else and is applied somewhere else. So as we start at the sun and go throughout these levels the energy never disappears it just uh, radiates convex or conducts somewhere else. This is the sun. It's large. It's about 90 mi million miles away from Earth. Um, but we get a lot. The main source of, of all of our energy as living things uh, comes directly from the sun. So um, that is where we begin. And good thing for us and for all living things, there are some organisms called producers that can actually take sunlight add a couple of gases and water or CO2 and water and then can actually make food out of that whole thing along the way they give off oxygen as well which we happen to need very much as well so these producers that can do photosynthesis using the energy from the Sun is the basis of any food chain or web those are the producers you can see that wherever there is the most water or precipitation and sunlight is where you're gonna see areas of our world light up in green on this uh, video it display the areas in green indicate that there is being food produced photosynthesis is going on where we are in North America we produce a lot more during some times of the year than others. <coughs> Winter that is not typically a time for production for us. Uh, but that is the production of food. So that is where we begin. Uh, these are producers. Typically we think of plants. Uh, it can be uh, marine uh, plants or producers. It can be protists, bacteria as well. Those are also known to do photosynthesis uh, if they are phototrophic. Uh, but that is the base of our energy pyramid that will be referred to throughout this video. So here are some producers. Uh, they are at the base. In actuality, they receive about 1% of the sun's energy that reaches Earth is used by these producers. The rest of the energy is either convected, radiated, or conducted uh, throughout our Earth and beyond into space. Uh, but one percent of that energy that comes from the Sun that reaches Earth goes toward food production. Good thing for us. And just that one percent can sustain an amazing amount of life. Uh, animals, of course, cannot make their own food to get energy from, as plants do. So they must do respiration, and we know about that. That's when we eat food in the presence, and in the presence of oxygen can break that food down to get energy. Uh, so the organisms that you see here are animals, and they are consumers. Okay, The first level above producer is called a primary consumer. These are the animals that eat the producers. They eat plants, typically they're herbivores. You can get omnivores that will be the primary consumer in a situation. Uh, but a primary consumer, again, is uh, the animal uh, or thing that eats the producer. It should be noted that only 10% of the energy that is produced by the producer goes on to the next level. And then when something eats the primary producer, only 10% of that energy goes on to that secondary consumer. For instance, let's say there's a head of lettuce here. And there are 10 calories worth 
of lettuce. When the primary consumer, this cricket, eats those 10 calories of lettuce, about 10% of that goes toward its body and uh, goes toward the food that makes up that body of the cricket. 90% of that energy from the lettuce is lost uh, to do normal body functions within the cricket. Um, so 90% of that energy is lost. So when a spider comes by and eats this cricket, or many of them, only 10% of the energy that it ate will go to the spider. Okay, so of that 10 calories, of which the cricket ate the whole 10 calories, only one of those calories would be transferred to uh, the spider from that original lettuce. If a bat comes by and eats the spider, that lettuce, you'll notice, has lost 90% at each level along the way, leaving there only 0.1 calories of lettuce um, from that original lettuce to get to the bat. So bats need to eat a lot of spiders. Spiders need to eat a lot of crickets in order to survive. And it's also the reason that primary consumers are some of the largest uh, and have the most biomass. There's huge herds of bison. Think of the largest animals on the planet. You think of blue whales, elephants, hippos. Those are all primary consumers that eat plants because that is the most energy that is available. As we move on, so here are the primary consumers the herbivores, the ones that eat the plants. The next level, there's less energy available for, so there will be fewer of these in any ecosystem. There's just not as much energy left. Yet, these animals thrive very well when there is enough primary consumer around. Secondary consumers eat the things that eat the plants. Okay, they eat the primary consumers. Uh, lions, bats, fish, raccoons, they can all be secondary consumers if they are eating the things that eat plants. So here we go on our food pyramid here, not food pyramid, but energy pyramid. Uh, secondary consumers, you'll notice that it gets more narrow. It's not 90% more narrow, so it's not perfectly accurate, but you should know that there will be fewer secondary consumers in any ecosystem compared to primary consumers or producers. Above them on the energy pyramid are the tertiary consumers. Tertiary consumers consume the secondary consumers. So these can be very, uh, very key to the environment that they live in to keep the population of either primary or secondary consumers down uh, so that producers can thrive. Uh, all of these levels are vitally important. We'll get to those relationships later. Uh, here we have an eagle that might eat the snake, that ate the frog, that ate the plant, or the insect that ate the plant. So um, tertiary and beyond that quaternary consumers are typically kind of at the top of the food chain, uh, the top of our energy pyramid. Here's an orca, there's a rattlesnake. Uh, they eat the secondary consumers and of course 90% of the energy is lost once again so there will be fewer of these tertiary consumers. So fewer and fewer amounts of energy are available as we travel up the energy pyramid. Uh, one thing that we should point out is that this energy pyramid before this slide did not include decomposers, a very vital important part uh, of the ecosystem that recycles uh, the dead material and biomass into useful nutrients so that producers can continue to thrive. If they continue to take out all the resources and the nutrients and the water within the soil without it being replenished by these decomposers, uh, waste managers, uh, the whole ecosystem would be uh, thrown off. So in every ecosystem each animal or plant has to find its niche uh, within the environment where they can survive and grow and reproduce and in some time in some ways outcompete the others that are there. All right, that brings us to a food chain and food webs. Uh, a food chain is different than a food web. 
Uh, it is a diagram that will display what eats what uh, along the way and what they might be dependent on. Uh, so one thing to remember is that the thing doing the eating is what the arrow is pointing to. If the alligator eats a, a prey, a wildebeest, let's say, um, that crocodile or alligator uh, would be having the arrow go toward it. That's where the energy is going. So the arrow indicates where the energy is going and it's pointing to the thing doing the eating. So on this food chain you have a grasshopper eating the grass. You have a mouse that would eat the grasshopper since the arrows indicate that. And then an owl would eat the mouse. Producer, primary consumer, secondary consumer, tertiary consumer. I kind of like, I'm partial to food webs myself. Uh, I would rather see all of the relationships because food webs don't, or food chains, however, don't really tell the whole story. What if something else is part of the diet of these different animals? Uh, food webs uh, are able to, uh, they are diagrams that maybe paint a, a clearer picture uh, for the whole ecosystem and the community of organisms within it. Uh, you can really start to see relationships here. For example, if, if phytoplankton were not as successful, the krill would, very, would suffer very much because the krill is eating those. So when phytoplankton suffers, the krill suffers, which is the only food source shown in this food web for the blue whale. So just because they're not connected by an arrow on a food web doesn't mean they don't depend on every single other organism, if not most of them, in the environment. So we have these keystone species that are so vital for the environment, and that's why critically in endangered species that are identified um, can be a big deal, because if one goes, the others might fall as well. That is it for energy. We'll see you next time.